Hey everyone, welcome back to the shop. So as you can see, we've really started to accumulate a bit of uh, some serious metrology equipment here at the uh, here at the lab. So we've got some of your standard things like LVDTs. We've got LVDIs like this Tessa here. But today we're going to be talking about the newest addition to the equipment, which is this microsense capacitive gauge, which you see here. It's really neat and adds some new capabilities that we didn't have before. So let's take a look, briefly look at the, the setup and how it works, and then basically just have some fun and do some crazy demos showing off how sensitive it is. So here we have the gauge and setup. Uh, basically, this is a capacitive gauge we got off of eBay. It came with a probe, but the probe was crushed and damaged beyond repair. So we sort of had to rig up our own setup to get it up and running. Funnily enough, the solution to this ended up being just slicing the coax cable that the old probe was connected to and epoxying it into a steel housing. Uh, the If you look at the schematic of a capacitive probe, or not schematic, but just a diagram, it is essentially just a coax cable. And generally the theme is the smaller the core sensing electrode, the more sensitive it is. So this small cable ended up being a really, you know, nice tight uh, form factor and you know, worked pretty well as a, uh, as a, as a gauge. So all we have to do is calibrate it, which we have using our uh, other LVDT gauge. And now we have a totally functional cap probe uh, that has a pretty decent sensitivity. So the amplifier here itself does have a little analog voltage scale. As you can see, the output is plus or minus 10 volts. And if I come over here and bend the arm that the gauge is set up on, you can see the scale moving over there. The way it's set up, I'll see if we can show this. Yep, you can see there's just a minuscule gap between the probe and the target, which is this lapped steel puck here. That target is grounded just to give, you know, slightly better uh, noise or slightly lower noise in the signal and you see the output on the scale there. That uh, scale is all right but if we want to realize the real benefits of this gauge we have to zoom in a little deeper and so to do this we've got that uh, analog output from the amplifier hooked up to our Digilent Analog Discovery 3 and that's reading out on the computer here and so on this scale over here, it's kind of hard to see right now, uh, but this is plus or minus 100 millivolts. Uh, we've calibrated this particular uh, probe over here to have a sensitivity of 0.22 micro inches per millivolt. So this whole full scale here is just over 40 millionths or one micron. Uh, and that's a pretty nice, pretty nice zoom. Uh, what I'll do now is overlay uh, an image of this in the video, uh, just to screen record that separately so it's actually uh, legible. And then we can do a couple fun demos with this and see, you know, just how sensitive it is. Okay, so first let's take a look at the sensitivity of this thing, just from a vibration standpoint. Uh, the way we have this set up, we've got our solid granite uh, indicator base here that's hooked up to this rack and pinion and then the gauge is out on this fine adjust arm which is on a one inch diameter 01 uh, steel bar. So as you can see, if I touch this bar at all, uh, you get massive deflections on the gauge and the reason you see this little tapered roller bearing here is because this is actually a better way to zero it than with the micrometer. Uh, the micrometer works 
but there's some amount of stiction to it and it ends up that just flicking it is the best way to get it to you know move in very small increments but with this bearing housing here you can just slide it and get very very small adjustments once you let it settle that is just by moving it closer or farther away to change the bending moment on the on the whole beam here and bending the gauge closer or farther uh, away from the, the target. Of course, any amount of touching of the table here is immediately detected. Uh, if I step over here and stomp on the ground, I don't even know if you would call that stomping, but tapping your feet certainly has an effect. Uh, so very sensitive and the other thing this allows us to see is the incredible thermal sensitivity of everything around us. There's of course the classic demo that Robin Renzetti showed which is let's just breathe on this bar here. Big movement but you can see it soaks back down uh, and comes back to an equilibrium as the heat distributes and that gradient dissipates. We can do the inverse with this can of canned air. What I'll do is if I just turn it upside down and barely pull the trigger, you can see I can get this little drop to accumulate on the end of the liquid difluoroethane that this is filled with. And that boils at negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's accumulate one drop of it and touch it to the top of the uh, indicator stand here. Almost completely off scale, but as you can see, it very rapidly soaks back and comes back to an equilibrium. To demonstrate the difference in thermal conductivity between steel and granite, I can do a similar thing where I spray some of this chilled uh, refrigerant onto the surface plate itself. I'm going to spray it right around here. As you can see, the uh, reading on the great gauge starts to increase. And when you think about it, this makes sense. I've cooled the top of the granite right here so it contracts and when that pinches, it pinches the top and bends the whole beam, bends the whole well, beam, but the plate, and sort of curls it up like a potato chip. But you'll notice it's taking a lot longer to come back to an equilibrium than the steel, and that's because the you know, thermal gradient takes a lot longer to dissipate as it takes longer for heat to travel through the granite. I can accelerate this a bit by just putting my hand on the granite there and warming it up that way. And then you see the gauge start to move in the other direction at a high rate. Really crazy stuff. Of course, dragging my finger along the granite beam here is having the effect of bending this, this uh, three inch granite column I can bend that pretty much just like a rubber band without much effort. It's it's really incredible uh, what what this this stuff lets you see. I've yet to get tired of it. Uh, practically, the use for this is we have you know these gauges of high resolution, but they are not of high bandwidth, and we're investigating some issues on the diamond turning lathe involving oscillations in the air bearings on the z-axis. And while these gauges do, in theory, have enough resolution, they don't have the bandwidth uh, to pick those up and read them. And because this is completely non-contact, you don't have any gauging force, and the nature of the driving electronics, it has an extremely high bandwidth. And so we'll use this to successfully diagnose the, uh, the oscillations we're seeing and finding out if those are actually causing issues in our surface finish or not. Now you'll notice throughout this whole thing there has been some uh, noise, some just sort of 
a noise floor in the signal of you know about 20 millivolts or so. Now we don't know yet whether this is electronic noise or actual mechanical noise from just it existing on this floor in this building. And so the next step is to put it on the vibration isolation table and see if that plays any difference. Uh, the 20 millivolt noise floor of course corresponds to a approximately four micro inch uh, noise floor, which is certainly not ideal and higher than we'd need to pick up the oscillations that we want to see on the uh, diamond turning lathe. So let's hop over to the vibration isolation table and see if the results are any better. Well guys, unfortunately, moving it over to the vibration isolation table did not fix the problems seems to be some sort of an electrical noise. Uh, the noise floor is still about the same at about 20 millivolts. You'll notice though, the uh, signal is also jumping all over the place for entirely unknown reasons. Uh, the setup over here is, you know, notably different. It's on the Noga arm now, uh, set up on a, a solid base and target or pointed over the same target. Uh, but ever since I've set it up, here, the signal just seems to be sort of randomly fluctuating up to almost a micron um, at unknown intervals and due to unknown reasons. Uh, there's really nothing changing around it environmentally. Not entirely sure why that is, um, but the bottom line is the noise floor that we were seeing wasn't mechanical, unfortunately. Don't know if this is going to work out for the uh, uh, for seeing what we want to see on the z-axis. The amplitude of those vibrations were really on the scale of about a about a micro inch or so. So, not sure if this is going to cut it. Uh, regardless, we do have some tests coming in the future um, to try and diagnose these problems um, that involve cutting the air to the air bearings mid-cut and other controversial topics like that. So, stay tuned, and maybe we'll figure this out and get some better surface finishes shooting for a sub 10 nanometer RA soon but yeah anyways this is kind of weird looking um, I'm gonna see if I can figure out why this is happening but hope you guys found this interesting and uh, I'll see you next time